Here is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We open up our monthly studies dedicated to Paisi Vidyshovsky, the righteous father of the 18th century, who was aware of the presence of Christ's otherworldly witnessing here upon this earth for 18 centuries. And as a young boy, his soul was disturbed by the fact that this 2,000 year experience, no, 2,000 year experience, of Christ's presence among human beings, that is, divinity among earthly fallen beings, is rapidly substituted by values of this fallen world, the human values. In other words, he lived in the age of so-called enlightenment which is a result of the Renaissance period, <coughs> and lived in Russia in a society that has been dedicated to Byzantine way of seeing things. The Western mentality began to creep in, and this young, pure uh, soul felt the oddity of this apostatic approach to, uh, or rather, uh, an encounter with people who have been descendants of catacomb mentality. In other words, the conscience of people in his, in his personality was uh, disturbed, confronted, and actually rejecting the values of Western society, the values of so-called enlightened age. And he began to ache and pain and wanted to have confirmation that that ancient Christianity, the Byzantine way of seeing things, is still alive. Now, mind you, that took place in a country, in Kiev and so on, which was, as we call now, I mean, it was, no, nobody doubted, there was a Holy Russia period. He was able to spot that um, confrontation of so-called Renaissance man, or man of the society that it was reviving paganism. Renaissance, it's a revival, of, a rebirth of paganism. And he began to search uh, whether that very um, holy Russia or holiness and all that, whether that is still there or is it doomed, is going to be destroyed by this universal movement of apostasy. Now, of course, we look back and see that, well, but that's in primitive uh, time. It was a long time ago. We are now living a much worse the situation, but the principle was the same. His contemporary, Tichon of Zadonsk, was confronted with the same, um, same big problem, that what are the values, or rather the Christian values, are they valued and adhered and sort of defended and promoted in view of the uh, rising Spirit of anti-Christianity started with the um, um, spirit of uh, Renaissance and later on um, this Enlightenment with Voltaire and all these revolutionary ideas, which later on, you know, destroyed Holy Russia and destroying now our fabric here. Whether there are any people who oppose that, who consciously rise up and do something uh, in defense of humiliated and actually again crucified Christ in the Christian society. He had those questions and as we know from his life 
he was dissatisfied receiving a positive answer. He was looking all over in Russia, then in Moldavia, in his territory, where there were many holy people, then went to Mount Athos. To the, his great surprise, he did not find any people there. It's not true. There were holy people at that time. There was at least one person, Akakias, true saint, holy man, lived at that time. But he didn't see him. It was, you know, hiding in the, in the caves. But he was, he didn't want to see, you know, he didn't want, he probably never doubted that there are people hiding like that. He wanted someone to promote Christianity, comes out and say, hey, this is, this is Christianity, this is resurrected human being. And then he didn't see any. And he was very despondent. Just like Tikhon Zadonsky even abandoned his see. Sir asked to be um, retired in a thing, in a week after he became a bishop. Um, he realized or so and decided to retire right away. He couldn't um, tolerate that. But in the case of Paisi Virichkovsky, a very interesting thing occurred. He discovered the holy writings. This is the key of Paisi Virichkovsky. He did not find an embodiment of Christian spirituality. He didn't see, uh, like, something like Archbishop John at that time, coming in full Christian glory. Didn't care a bit what the world thinks. Just went on and went on. So bravely and fearlessly. He didn't see that. Even Mount Athos in a holy place like that. But he discovered the writings of the Holy Fathers. In other words, the answer in his case, as he teaches us, lies not so much in embodiment of personalities, which we can, we can see, but in the factual existence of the writings of Holy Fathers. We have documentation of the sanctity of Jesus Christ and that very sanctity reflected in his followers as an apostles, so Holy Fathers ending up in modern, in modern times. And this is the key of Paisi Vyshkovsky and the message that he bequeathed upon Orthodox Christians and all Christians who really care about Christ, that there is um, a possibility to acquire energy and living um, um, necessary, um, almost like a pacemaker, it's just, uh, something that gives strength and enlightens and um, justifies um, Christianity in the face of the rising anti-Christianity apostasy. That's why he's very meaningful, Pais Wichkowski, very meaningful for us today. Although it's 200 years, next year will be exactly 200 years since he died. He died in 1794. And we know that his significance was tremendous in Russia and Moldavia. Moldavia or Romania, even today, reaps the fruits of Paisian disciples. One of our sisters, Mother Nina, most of you know her, she is now in Romania, almost a year, I think, and she plans to stay longer. She's studying, she found Holy Fathers there, uh, elders. In fact, she's recently wrote to me a letter that she, would, she found some very good place. And she was being, asking blessing to stay there, and I blessed her. Um, she's immersing herself in a full Paisian tradition, which is still alive. It was persecuted and so on. But <clears throat> in Russia, it gave tremendous flowering in the whole phenomena of Optina elders. We know even Saint Seraphim is direct descent and, and the disciple of the Paisian influence. The whole Saint John of Kronstadt is bound up with it. Ignatius Benicinino, Fiafan the Recluse, and the rest of them. They all are indebted to Paisi. To, because Paisi took upon himself, he not just found those books, read them, and put them back on the shelves. No. He began to live them. He used that as um, those holy fathers, uh, the Philoca in fact, it was he who actually compiled 
the philokalia, the contents of the philokalia that we know of, the philokalia, the philokalic wisdom. It comes actually from him. He combined it. So he gave tremendous sort of a push towards uh, acquiring the power of Christianity. And one righteous uh, thinker even claims that the um, the revolutionary in Russia attempt to destroy uh, orthodoxy and later on using the renovationist movement was actually directed to the influence of Paisi Vichkovsky. So the heart of that was Paisi Vichkovsky. That is an element or a personality that was determined to he found it and was determined to use it. So it works. His mother was Jewish. That means he's real tough. And uh, his father, a priest, a very, very pious, very dedicated priest. And so he had a good makeup. And he acquired that and used that and installed in the whole nation through his disciples this very teaching. He would translate those texts. He would uh, recopy him. He would install into various students, since we heard Claire Moore and Elder, he would figure out what you need, and he would give a certain element. He'll say that you have such weakness and such weakness, you'll get that Holy Father. Read that. Chew on that. He was a doctor. He was almost a, um, a surgeon. He would almost uh, make incision and install that thing, like a pacemaker, and, and he started ticking in you. This was his contribution. That's why our um, brotherhood decided to um, use the facilities of this abbey and dedicate our labors to the memory of Paisi Vichkovsky, hoping that we would learn something from him, from what he represented. When he died, he had hundreds of disciples who had boxes and boxes of manuscripts. Nowadays, of course, it would be very easy. If they had then Xerox machines, it would be wonderful. But they didn't, so they had to copy by hand. But they made a system that when they copy, they would stand. They were special analogians, special lighting, and they would stand. And they would pray, they would cross themselves and copy with prayer. So that these copies were actually the result of prayer. They had a very, and Anthony of Optin even had, his whole legs were ruined because of endless amount of standing and copying, calligraphying clearly these texts, which they would pass on to others with fear and trembling. They saw in these texts um, um, this um, awesome energy coming, and they purified themselves to take in that literature that those texts uh, with like scripture which actually interprets scripture is a commentary on scripture um, and this very process of copying was salvific in itself this copying itself with fear and trembling nowadays we're very easy we have this machine I put the that chemical into it and we just zoom with large small round <laughs> All comes out here, here, and distributed, and that's it. We have no awesome attitude towards it. This is a word of God. Um, some of us are smart and have respect towards uh, Xerox machines and uh, <laughs> wisely use it. And because of Xerox machines, very easy. You can get the rare material, Xerox, and you get the rare stuff, which, which are in the rarest libraries. You go for miles and to just get it, and here you can get right there, and the mail right there. So we're very fortunate. That gives us tremendous opportunity to change ourselves and to become saints. But without discipline, we can't do it. Therefore, we decided to have not only dedicate this place, a lovely place, and fountains now, and floating lilies, and so on, and not only that, but we wanted very much to have some kind of a disciplinary attempt to be able to 
um, out of reverence towards Paisi Vichkovsky, to spread this so that people, maybe some, can catch, like Paisi Vichkovsky, catch and multiply and sort of go crazy over it and produce uh, fruit. With this, that's why we're here. At the same time, today is the eve of the repose of Archbishop John. Here we have Paisi Vichkovsky and Archbishop John. And Archbishop John, most of you know, was a man uh, who also was a disciple, the indirect descendant of Paisian, Paisian uh, school, was a man who was acquired um, spiritual life in and added to it fearlessness. It's the opposite of being coward, opposite of being weak, opposite of being manipulated by our advertisement system in the 20th century. He refused. He opposed it. He considered a man is created in the image of God, and he has, has to be disciplined, and he has to act according to what his conscience, his purif purified, constantly purifying conscience, is dictating him to do, and not manipulated by advertisement world, which actually wants to enslave us. Of course, I'm talking on a higher level. It's not just like, for example, walking a mile for a camel is not just somebody's silly invention, but that moves people on a podvik in order to kill themselves through smoking. We don't think about this, but that's what it does. I can give you names, addresses of people who are actually hooked to this thing, and like, they'd walk really a mile. And in Platina, they did. In fact, a mile, almost two miles. Uh, they had no energy to do prostrations or calligraphy. They have no energy to, to copy a page, but they had energy to walk a mile, a mile actually almost two miles down the hill and then up the hill sweating. <laughs> it worked. It worked for, for, for a camel company. It didn't work but by Isi Wichkovsky and all our big talk. It so it means we are already influenced. Somebody else is installing into us a desire for Podwig. And we do the Podwig for devil actually, not for Jesus Christ. Because our weakness, because of lack of our discipline. Many people ask to us today, why is Christianity so weak? Why aren't we really standing up for this? Well, it's very simple. We've been exposed to this manipulation by the world and we expose ourselves to, to the world and accept that. And those realities, you deserve a break and this Pepsi generation and uh, walking a mile is a serious thing that shapes us, yes. Then we have even the victims come along and they are victims. They come to us and say, save us, help us, help us. But they are up to here in this state of decomposition, moral decomposition. Then they grab at Jesus' feet, help, help. Well, maybe he helps some, same he does. But we as pastors see that doesn't work. You can't help them. They sink. Unless their own will is be changed and they'll have a different attitude. And they will not walk a mile for that, but instead they'll make prostrations or stand and copy and learn by heart about the Holy Fathers, the, what St. Peter Damascene, for example, had to say. Now, St. John, our Archbishop John, blessed our brotherhood <coughs> and our activity, and we're very indebted to him. And it's very, very significant that on the eve of his they, we are gathered here so that we believe he will bless our work in acquiring the patristic mind. This is what we're after. We'd like to acquire a patristic mind. And we have a good teacher, Paisi Vyshkovsky, to do that. All right, having said those two points, with water. Uh, do I have to walk there? No, no. Yeah. Just, somebody has to.
Uh, Justin, could you bring me some water? <coughs> All right, now two points. Point one is we have Paisi Bidichkovsky. You have to know about him during our meals. We'll hear the life of Paisi Bidichkovsky. It's been published by us. It's out of print, unfortunately, but we hope someday we'll have some money and we'll be able to reprint it. Because our books don't sell, you know. If you go to uh, Dalton's, you won't find them. You'll ask them, say, Sir, I'd like to have Paisi Bidichkovsky book. And say, is that in print, sir? I said, yes, it is. Or rather, in the book, it's there. They look it up, it's there. And if you ask them, well, couldn't you keep it on the shelf? No. We tried. We asked Baba Fried, what is it, Baba Fried Jones, whatever his name is. <laughs> he asked to sell it. He takes 55% on selling acquisition. And so he did us a favor. He put acquisition to Dalton, in the whole of the East Coast, in Dalton's. They have acquisition. Well, they kept it for half a year, and then in return we had to pay for it. We got nothing. Nobody buys it. Nobody knows about it. Because no one, no one really told them that they should walk a mile and a half to get it. <laughs> and therefore no one gets it. You know what I mean? It's that simple. So, now we're expected to know all about Paisi You have to do that on your own. Point two is Archbishop John blesses our uh, talks, our school here, we believe, and I think it would be important that every one of you um, know Archbishop John, especially the book that we published, um, and it doesn't sell too well, you know. Uh, Blessed Archbishop John, 400-page book, which is now not only translated into Russian, but is being published, printed by our mission in Moscow today. See? We hope that it will, in fact, Saturday, the translator will come here and give you lectures. Professor Vladimir, who is uh, Shinkin, who is um, very much enthused um, <coughs> with what we're, what we're doing. So, he actually helped also to translate um, the biography of Father Serfim. And he's coming here to give lectures too. So that's very nice. All right, so Archbishop John and Paisi Vichkos. Now, we Orthodox Christians are very much concerned, um, or rather we are disturbed by the fact that we have discovered Orthodoxy and we find um, spiritual life quite attractive and of course it's hard and so on but it makes a lot of sense but at the same time we notice that our society today uh, we feel it's in dire need of being shaped by orthodoxy sure but we also find very hard to um, sort of promote it or to with each day we feel that the field of hearing us, or um, uh, uh, the field of the world of uh, um, uh, receiving orthodoxy is becoming darker and darker. It becomes harder and harder because um, the moral element is obviously declining. And therefore, we very often, many of us, are quite disturbed and some lament terribly, especially a simple thing like that. We don't have Christian communities. The Orthodox is divided into all these jurisdictions. Um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Roman uh, Catholics fight us, and the Protestants, everyone pulls each other. Sort of Christianity is um, divided and scattered and doesn't seem to have any power, especially before this lawlessness and this immorality which is spreading uh, rapidly and actually captivating the souls of our children to such an extent that some even join satanic armies. And we, Orthodox Christians, somehow, having discovered Orthodoxy, we somehow feel paralyzed. We can't even have some kind of a, um, schools going on for our children, so Christian camps or some kind of input. Somehow we disaster. And we are very much interested in a missionary approach to 
uh, uh, to Orthodox, our Orthodox activity. So we will be able to um, not only make Orthodox our private business, sort of a closet case, but on the contrary, we'd like to make it more accessible to others. And I must inform you that it's very, very fortunate that our uh, society is interested, becoming more and more interested in orthodoxy. We do reach here and there a little bit. People do pay attention. We open up bookstores and people pass by and peek in and get an icon and a couple of books free or something. We labor hard. Most of the time it's very rewardless. But uh, nevertheless, the attempt is, and here once in a while, uh, uh, sort of like the Paisian the vision of the devil, some fool <coughs> gets interested in uh, the patristic writings and we have to the devil say we have to send legions of demons to combat that some fool gets hold of these dirty rags <laughs> meaning the writings of holy fathers and then we are compelled to send thousands of uh, legions in order to combat that work which that fool is doing like a, like a bookstore full, you know. So say. I'm talking about the chapter in Paisi Vishkovsky. Those who read the chapter know what I'm talking about. Now, therefore, missionary approach. And we'd like very much to have, we are not, of course, qualified, we are poor people, not very smart, but we'd like very much to get together and get something achieved. And we have a month here, the month of our courses, on various subjects. Soon you will see a schedule. We'll have um, all subjects, as any seminary. We actually go, in principle, we'll take the principle of the Jordanville Holy Trinity Seminary uh, courses and divide in such a way that it's applicable because we are on different ages, different experiences. Um, I don't know how, how much we can acquire, but we'll have, that's our model, we we'll go by. And um, the training, the uh, seminary or missionary training, um, is of course a fragmentary thing. You can get only so much. That it takes five years. And we expect to get a whole course of five years in just one month. It's a little bit too much to ask. But if we get bits and bits and pieces here, sort of systematically, then we can piece together and something get rich, enrich ourselves. We have also, in connection with that, or rather one of the big emphases, will be on liturgics, on the, um, uh, the science of serving God, on uh, praying, and uh, both private and public. Each pastor in old times had a book called Yudeyski Malitva Slov. It's a thick book like this, sort of like, a, I guess, that the Anglican uh, Book of Common Prayers. <coughs> but it contains that. But it also contains um, the whole of calendar. You know, it's the, uh, the saints. It's called Men uh, Menologian. The saints for, t for the each, uh, each month and gives the triparians and so on. So in other words, it leads you to the, um, in, in, uh, in brief, in co it contains man's, um, man's stand before God for one year. It includes the morning prayers, you know, the prayers of the daily cycle, the prayers of the weekly cycle, the prayers of the monthly cycle, and thus yearly. It contains, as Father Adrian, my spiritual father, has said that the soul of a priest is contained in this book. The priest is living that book. He reads, he gets inspired, he sheds tears, he repents, and confronts, and has conversation with those who preceded him and now dwell in heaven, the saints. Um, therefore, our uh, tone is, of course, they, uh, turned 
towards liturgic, towards the prayer. That is, we therefore have daily services here, and we uh, consider it's essential that each person attends all the services, and while they're praying, he's supposed to be not just standing, but squeezing his heart out. Because, as the fathers say, the real man is he who prays. Because then he is fully the body and the soul at work before the Creator, directed to the crea his own Creator. And this becomes this bling, uh, the, the body, the, er the earth, the world, the body, the soul, which is created for God, by God, and God himself who hears you. And this becomes the blending of one, the three things. <clears throat> Therefore, we will uh, have, not only we'll talk about this, but we will also participate in daily services about how it's going to be do, how it's going to be done, who is going to do what we'll, we'll, the fathers will decide. Now, uh, the course is mission, orthodox missionaries. What are they? Not necessarily who are they, but what are they? What actually is that element of orthodox missions? Of course, it is apostolic, apostles. Now I have to tell you six points. One, now this is history. This is. First, we will discuss those subjects here. We'll have pastoral theology and literature and scripture and liturgics and so on. Is divided, whatever. But mean I have to say these, these, this concerning missionaries. Missionaries were apostles. The first point one is the catacomb period, which made the missionary work in whisper. All they could do is whisper, because they were persecuted. They were constantly trapped. They were brought to uh, various trials, killed, dissected, thrown into the lion's dens, and so on. This early period of uh, catacombs is the formative period when everything was formed, and actually it's not like an embryo. The child is developing in the womb, in the embryo, and when it comes out, it's already full, full human being. He's detached from the mother. And the name of finished. He's an independent individual. Not fully independent, still a screaming individual. But he is detached. So Christianity in the catacombs was developing. And everything was developed. Everything there. And during that time, the Christians could not openly come out and proclaim. Of course, some did and they were killed off right away. But they had to do the missionary work in whisper. Saint Paul, of course, I did not whisper, but he was, you know, beheaded. And all those who followed them, they were killed. So they risked a lot. But the spread of missionary work was actually done secretly. And because the society was so depraved, so immoral at that time, especially the Roman uh, empire that actually was their leaders of the world they were the princes of this world they persecuted with the help of devils evil spirits because the rising of Christianity was a threat to them which actually eventually was so that early period was when Christians had to develop their own purity of soul. And only under that condition they would be able to not say much, but at least in whisper. But it was so strong that it changed lives and created the whole, within a couple of centuries, the whole of civilization was actually in the hands of Christianity. And Christianity was the leading religion, the state even religion. So that's number one. Number two, when they came out of the catacombs, they obviously then could reach the end of the world. And they did. Byzantium, the emperor himself, 
uh, was helping and spreading, actually God himself through him worked because God sent a sign of the cross in the sky. And with that he was to conquer. And he conquered. And was able to give openly the message of Christians uh, on rooftops. And uh, pa apostleship took form in raising these missionaries that would freely go to the end of the world, apostles, and baptize people, and whole nations would turn to Christ. And number three, occurred the following. <coughs> That spirit of apostleship met resistance in various wrong teachings or teachings that disfigured the principles of Christ Christianity which Jesus brought upon this earth. That is heresies. So the apostleship had to combat heresies. And to help that, the emperor himself gathered first ecumenic council to determine what is the right teaching. And so the apostles, or the successors of apostles, gathered from the ends of the world, or earth and created the first council and determined, they gave us the creed, and determined what is the right teaching and what is wrong teaching, which is called heresy. And when you confront a person with the true teaching, let's say he adheres to the wrong teaching, and you confront to, the, to him with the right teaching, and he rejects the right teaching and adheres to his wrong, then he's heretic. But if he is not confronted with the fullness of Christianity, you have no right to call him a heretic, mm -hmm. which unfortunately nowadays everybody does. If you don't like him, so you say, oh, she's a heretic. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. Has, did you confront that person with? Did you display the fullness with the Paisian understanding of the, the whole world, that Jesus come? Do you, have you confronted that? Did she reject that? On the day and, and insisted on her own belief. Then she's a heretic. But unless you do not dis fully display the fullness of Christianity in full power, then you can't call her heretic. She just deluded, she does not, and mostly because you are not true Christian. You are not displaying the fullness of God, uh, which is expected. You're supposed to be God-bearer. You are not displaying God, godliness. And that's why, that's why she won't listen to you. Oh, you're just nobody else, just like anybody else, chewing pot potato chips and uh, doing the same thing that I still do. Why do you think you're better? Then you run around with cannons saying that you're, you're correct. Oh, well, maybe your, your book of canons is okay, but you're not according to those canons at all. You just show off, you just, you just push your own ideas, that's all. So you have no right to call heretic, heretic then. So they had to combat this um, world of heresies, and the councils came in and determined what is right. And number four is, it was not good enough just to have correct teaching. Because correct teaching will be only then if you read or lead a correct, disciplined way of life. Then the correct teaching will make sense to you. But if you don't, the correct teaching remains only in the book. So therefore, this, to combat the immorality or the lack of discipline came in the whole army of monastics to help combat that spiritual um, laxness and to give discipline in order to have the fullness of it. So it's an apostolic work, missionary work was placed upon monastics not necessarily walk from door to door and, and tell about them but to, to embody that right living in their own souls and to guard it 
That's why unseen warfare, divine ladder, and ladder of divine ascent, and so on. Then, number five. B when that army rose and held the church of monastics, then arose an element to oppose it. Or rather, the devils probably began to um, send more legions of their demons. And there had to, the Christian witness began to shrink because of apostasy. People began to take it easy because the teaching was uh, purified by the councils and uh, the various standards or various uh, disciplinary principles were defined in Asism. So, so they began to lose that fervency and you have the pros process of apostasy. This process of apostasy means stepping away from, to apostasize, apostasize means to step away from. Um, and the shrinking element of true Christians was in full force and the missionary activity was directed to that. We sort of live in that era. But soon we will be again in this very state as first catacomb Christians were. We will be forced to preach in whisper. The way that our government is leading our land, how we can see clearly through television and newspapers, we see clearly how unrighteousness takes the law in their hands. And we have a precedence in Russia. That's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. These lawless people began to crawl in to the government. And they began to install these loose things until finally the, sh sh uh, sh the whole society began to shake. As St. John of Russia said, the, the crown is shaking. Pray that the crown, the crown of ruling is shaking. The, and the rule, Christian society is ruled by the law of God. And they did not want it. They didn't want to have the law of God. And so the result was that it was taken away from them. Just as kept happening here. It's soon, probably soon, that freedom will be taken away from us and we will have to missionize in whisper. <coughs> but while it didn't happen, we still can talk on the top roof. The roof. We can open up bookstores, we can make a big spill there. Perhaps we can be big fish in a tiny bookstore, but we still can do it. And we should do it, and I think we should do it in a systematic way. And that is to place ourselves before the image of God, incarnate God, Jesus Christ, and do the thing that for 2,000 years Christians did had their noses poking in the corner where God is and developed in their souls the attitude that Paisi was looking for. Attitude when you behold God, first of all. And everything else, as Jesus says, will be added to you. Everything else was a result of that attitude as a result of you being hooked to Jesus. And then we have to, the soul is there, but our mind and our intellect has to be developed. We have Christian, Christian civilization to know. We have to know what actually constitutes genuine Christian civilization and use that as our measuring stick, as our rule, and as our uh, implement, our um, tools in order to help ourselves and those around us whom God sends. 
And God sends wonderful people around us. Oh, there are lots of, you know, sort of, no good as floaters here and there, you know, WHs, the, uh, from, uh, from, uh, WHs, you know that? War hyacinths. You can see right there. Float. Float. Lots of floaters. But at the same time, we have also very solid individuals who put roots, who endure all kinds of difficulties. Even their children don't perhaps listen to them. But nevertheless, they just, uh, just protrude and just go on and on. And we have a chance to do it. Therefore, this very course is dedicated to this very, first of all, this attitude of standing before God. Uh, but not totally placing everything there. Do something. And that's doing requires knowledge. How it was done in the past. How did the Christians do it? How did they lead such wonderful lives, left such a wonderful legacy, and actually behave like angels in the flesh? They went to heaven, and even from heaven they keep on working, making miracles, and, and uh, appearing, and all kinds of things. I just read a very interesting thing. Elder, uh, there was a righteous uh, priest, um, Anatole of Odessa, died 1920 something five. Uh, and he was a holy man. And he was so, he was a pastor, he was so sort of like a missionary pastor. He was so filled with this love to help people that there's testimonies that he would appear at the same time in different places. You know, his soul was so eager to help, and he knows that over there in um, Amsterdam, people are in trouble. And all of a sudden, he was he's standing, he's trying to help. All of a sudden, he pops up in Amsterdam and helps out. And then they say, "Oh, Father, how are you doing?" And it turned out to be this. He helped, but he was actually in Russia. How he explains? We don't know, but we know Jesus did. And a man in 1920, who died in 1920, did And that is um, because of his love towards the suffering soul. <coughs> All right, so that's, that's yes? Is number six that they're, they're returning to the catacomb, or? Both. Both. Yeah. Returning to the catacomb, you know, when the time will come, when we will not, we will have to hide. We'll have to, we'll not be able to make... But we're not uh, there yet. Not yet. <coughs> but that is the number six. That's number six. But we're now in number five. We're still in number five. I hope so. But Russia was number six. See, now they're returning to number five. <laughs> <laughs> but if we don't, we will, if we'll goof, then we're hastening the number six. Okay. Now, before we, it's already finished, right? I would like to um, say just a couple of words. Um, the, we are, um, we want very much, um, uh, where is that text? You're supposed to read the text about the instructions. I, suppose I want everyone to hear Every, it. Everyone has been passed out. Oh, they have it? Yes. So I don't have to. We're ready to go over it whenever. No, no, they, you know about this using toilets and all that. <laughs> Yes, and the final very important point. We are not attempting to make this a source of information. You got your own brains. You got good spectacles on. You, there are lots of good books being printed now in English. You use it. You do it yourself. Information you can get yourself. But how to appreciate this information, how to determine what is right, what is wrong, what is correct, that's what we're here. Therefore, our point is not necessarily to give you information, to crowd you with uh, text and all that. Our job is to, and that's the thing we could do. The first one, we can't give you too much. Just one month, you can't give you, you know, 10 years of uh, you know, theological studies. But we can do this. To indicate that the Christian experience, orthodox experience, so-called tradition, 
has also an unwritten tradition, oral tradition. Father Grassman is going to give you next next period. He's going to talk mention a little bit about that. In other words, the ordination occurs by laying on of hands, not necessarily giving him special information. The bishop, when he does that, he doesn't give you some check. Most of them really can't even check what's going on with you. But they pray and they install into you the spirit of that tradition which they receive finally from Jesus Christ, the ordination. So, <coughs> apostolic succession not necessarily rests in acquiring information. More than that, because we are, because the uh, word, word the, um, the written word is limited, therefore the spirit cannot be fully affixed upon paper. There was a wonderful Russian poet, his name was Tuchiv. And he says, a thought expressed in our words is already a lie. In other words, we are limited. The words are limited to express that which God gives through spirit. And he gives through, we know that the, wind, the, the um, uh, through Nicodemus, Jesus speaks and he says, the um, spirit uh, blows where it wants to, or where it lists. In other words, whatever it touches, and some, you can't even catch. So, oral tradition, or so-called, tra it was tradition, church tradition, that gave us the scripture. It's that oral tradition that determined what is tradition. I mean, what is the scripture? What value is some scripture? Well, some books are accepted, some books are not accepted as canonical books. But it's the tradition that determined it. So the scripture is part of tradition. And we're not talking about the tradition of man that St. Paul talking about, you know, just washing pots and so on. Although we just mentioned about those things. In our um, so therefore, it is necessary for us to realize that in passing on the sort of the attitude, the likes and dislikes, which often can't be said in words. Okay. <coughs> I'll, fa I'll end up by saying the following. When I was converted, a uh, long time ago, your grandparents even weren't, weren't born then, um, I was directed by the monk in John Mill, who sort of was responsible for my conversion, to a man, a, a priest, his wife and children, in, who founded Novodzivieva, Father Adrian. And this man heard me, heard my confession and whatever, you know, accepted me as spiritual son. He saw that I wanted to go to seminary. Well, I wanted to, I was, I discovered my faith and I loved it and I wanted to dedicate my, besides, I discovered the faith in, in a seminary, a monastery in seminary, so obviously I wanted to be there. And they all wanted me and they prepared everything, gave me scholarship and everything. So I came for blessing with Father Adrian. And he says, nothing doing. And he wouldn't give me the blessing to go to seminary. Instead, he said, well, why don't you go to university, take, you know, Boston University, nice university. He said, oh, I don't want this disgusting Boston University. I, I, pardon me, I know <laughs> some people are hurt. <laughs> pardon me. Uh, I said, I want, uh, I, I want the seminary, I want that they live this thing. He says, no, maybe you should go to take some classes from Schmemann. Oh, Schmemann. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I immediately took and started reading some of the Shmeman stuff. And I, meanwhile, before, uh, before that, I was reading all about St. Seraph and Paisi and um, uh, Obtina Elders and all that. He himself was a disciple of Obtina Elders. And he says, Shmeman. I don't know Shmeman. He did not give me blessing for four years to go to seminary. And since I loved him, I was very patient, and I was, you know, he's my spiritual father, he knows better, so I dragged along. Then finally I decided nothing, no more. 
I can't do it anymore. I'm going to be an old man. I want to go to seminary. Everything's prepared. They'll give me a room and board free. And uh, all my friends are there. Why shouldn't I? So I said, Bachka, you know, I come to tell you that I love you dearly and I've been very faithful to you and all this. But you know, there are limits. I, <laughs> I don't, I actually am going to act not according to your not being obedient. I already have everything prepared, and in September, I'm going. He said, whether you like it or not. He says, God bless, wonderful. <laughs> what do you mean? For four years you've been, <laughs> you've been um, um, uh, preventing me. What's the idea? He says, now you're determined. <laughs> now you want to do something. Otherwise, you'd sit and ride on my blessing. Sit around doing nothing and riding on my blessing, saying, Father, Father uh, Adrian blessed me, and therefore I'll be fine. No, you determined? You made your bed? I'll do it. Make a man out of yourself. But of course, he already did a big job. He, meanwhile, gave me a whole lot of books to read, and gave me a lot of instructions. He gave me suggestions what I should do. He spent a lot of time with me. So he actually prepared me to the seminary. And when I was determined, I put my own, I'm going to be responsible for my own behavior. I want God. So it's fine. Now you are ripe. And I was. And I'm very thankful to him. Because when I came to seminary, I did not waste my time. I didn't pay attention to that which was not necessary. I picked just the right thing. And I benefited 100%. I went through just three years out of the whole thing and I was very happy. The point is this, that we have to acquire, oh yes, one, and his, one of his statements was this, that before that you would look at a seminary as a source of information. But now you already chose what is right, what is wrong. You already feel it. Now you'll discern and emphasize this important information and less important that comes through tradition. So this is what we are here. We would like to pass on the tradition. But information, you can take it for yourself and discern. All right, that's clear? Any questions? <laughs> that afraid, boss. See, that's encouraging. <laughs>